Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Every day, the reporters in the WPLN newsroom are out on the beat, getting the stories that impact our neighborhoods, our city, and region. So today, we're bringing you a reporter roundup. Three reporters with three stories that affect the lives of Nashvillians and Middle Tennesseans. First up is Char Daston, reporter and newscast writer for WPLN. Char, good to have you on the show. Hey, Khalil. It's good to be here. Yes, sir. How's it going? Oh, I'm doing well. Uh, this Metro Arts story that I'm working on is using up like the majority of my brain space right now. There so. is a lot going on. Okay, so break down to us what exactly is going on. Yeah, I'll give you the latest. So the backdrop of this story is that arts organizations that applied for city funding from Metro Arts are still waiting on 50% of the grant money that they were promised from last year's grant funding cycle. They Mm. received the first half of the money back in December, months late. So there have already been a lot of delays, and they're still waiting for that that second 50%. So the the, the news that broke earlier this month is that um, the city finance director, Kevin Crumbo, co-wrote a memo to the Metro Arts Board of Commissioners um, saying, yes, the city has the money to pay the 50% of this grant money to these organizations, but he's not going to give it to Metro Arts for the money to be distributed until he can trust them with it. Hmm. Um, So uh, what he wanted them to do uh, as a first step was for the Metro Arts Commission to create a budget and oversight committee that he can meet with to to build that trust. Um, So the Metro Arts Commission did create that committee. Um, They're going to meet for the first time on Monday. You know, there are some in the arts community that say, wait, hold on a second. Metro finance shouldn't have all that power over another metro department like yeah. that doesn't make any sense and and plus you know the arts organizations have been waiting so long for that money and they're in dire need and 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 to wait longer would would create more problems so they they say come on Kevin Crumbo hand it over um but there are other people who say you know the fact that the person in charge of you know the city finances um doesn't trust the Metro Arts Department with that money, you know, that's a sign of a serious breakdown of trust between Metro departments. And that's really, uh, we should take this opportunity to slow down and investigate what's going on. Meanwhile, uh, the legal director of of Metro, uh, Wally Dietz, co-wrote that memo with Kevin Crumbo, and he announced that uh, multiple staff members of Metro Arts have come forward uh, with HR complaints about workplace misconduct and that the legal department has hired an outside law firm to investigate um, those workplace misconduct claims. Uh, We don't know exactly what those are yet, um, but we got a clue in the last Metro Arts Commission meeting um, this, this past Thursday that things are not going well in the Metro Arts staff. Um, The new grants manager, Sydney Davis uh, spoke up during the meeting um, And she basically said that she's been trying to reform the grants funding process a little bit this year so it goes more smoothly. But essentially, she says that her decisions have been undermined. Um, And realistically, I'm not in a space to make changes. I have requested. um, I have very directly asked to be able to implement some of my recommendations. And I was told I had to wait until April. So just to give you... Uh, an idea of the drama of that situation, of her speaking up during that meeting. At Metro Arts Commission meetings, the entire staff of Metro Arts is there with the commissioners. So she's speaking up, and her boss, the Metro Arts director, Daniel Singh, is sitting there across the table from her. So the fact that she is making complaints about management in front of her manager is a sign that things are not going well. And furthermore, the fact that the grants manager is saying, I'm trying to make changes so that things go smoothly this year and they're not happening. 
uh, is not a vote of confidence for these arts organizations that really want the the grants process in 2024 to go smoother than it did in 2023. All of this happening with the Metro Arts Council sounds like a lot of drama. Mm-hmm. Pardon the pun. Yes. Okay. So, you know, how did we get here? Why was last year's grant funding cycle such a kind of ridiculous mess? Yeah. Uh, well, buckle in. All right. <laughs> it's quite a story. So, um, Metro Arts, just to give you some background, this is the city department that funds all kinds of arts organizations from big, you know, really established organizations like the Symphony, like the Frist Art Museum, um, to, you know, smaller, um, newer organizations and and individual artists and, and projects. Um, so, you know, they have been plagued by scandal, unfortunately, for a few years. Um, the, it, back in 2022, the previous Metro Arts director resigned um, over allegations that she had treated some of her employees in a racist manner. Um, so the city looked for a new Metro Arts director, and they found this guy, Daniel Singh, who's the current director, who his specialty, his expertise is anti-racism and equity. So they thought, great. Um And Daniel Singh, when he came into office uh, as the Metro Arts director, said, you know, I'm going to go further than, you know, resolve these complaints of racist treatment of employees. I'm going to address the whole funding structure of how we fund the arts in Nashville and create more equity. Um, Basically, you know, a lot, you know, traditionally the lion's share of the Metro Arts grant money has gone to the same few organizations, these really established museums, the symphony um, that do great work. But there are a lot of people who say, well, if you're not connected to those organizations, then you don't and you're an artist, you don't get funding. So often that's artists from marginalized communities, um, disproportionately artists of color in Nashville that, that, that don't get those connections to those bigger organizations. So Daniel Singh said, we're going to try and get a lot more money out to smaller organizations and to individual artists. Um, he makes the grant process simpler. Um uh, makes there fewer questions on the applications. He also um, reaches out to a lot of communities that have never applied before, and they get in 2023 way more applications for mm. funding than they've ever had before. There's only one problem, which is that the city just has not budgeted enough money for all of these artists to get a fair share. So, uh, he asks the Metro Arts Commission to fund a lot of these newer, smaller artists and projects, um, give them more money than they ever have gotten before, and in exchange to cut some money from the bigger, more established organizations' funding. Um, they do that. Um, there's some legal snafus, and they have to rescind their vote uh, <laughs> uh, hmm. and vote again the next month, and this is the summer of 2023. So they meet again in August of 2023, and they rescind their vote. But instead of just doing the same thing that they did uh, the previous month, they actually make a different decision. And they take some of the money away from the smaller artists because they they really don't want to destabilize these bigger organizations that have come to depend on kind of the same money, same amount of money from Metro Arts every year. Okay. So there's this divide now of like... Um, these bigger, more established organizations and and the smaller organizations that expected more money. But the problems weren't over because there still wasn't enough money to pay everyone. And some of the money came from a mid-year allocation, which meant that they just found out in January that they had enough money to pay everyone. So that caused the delays in all the organizations getting paid. So there's this dispute over funding and there are these delays. Who... Who's to blame for all these issues? We are still figuring that out. Um, I am every day looking into it, um, but so are a lot of other people. So um, some of those individual artists who feel that the Metro Arts Commission wronged them by promising them money and then taking it away, they have filed a complaint with the Metro Human Relations Commission saying that what was done to them was illegal. Um, So the Metro Human Relations Commission, organization is is investigating what happened there. Uh, the city's auditor is doing an audit of Metro Arts's financial procedures uh, to figure out what happened with the funding delays. Um, and, and I just told you, you know, um, there's 
these uh, workplace misconduct complaints that are being investigated, and the Metro Finance Director has held up the money. Um, so there's a lot of people who say, well, you know, um, Daniel Singh is the director of Metro Arts. The buck has got to stop with, stop with him. He says that most of the problems are not his fault. He says he blames um, bad advice and poor communication from other departments. Um, but they essentially say, no, you've been a really poor communicator. And it's just a fact that he has not been clear enough with these arts organizations that, hey, you're going to get the money later than usual. Um, and and so they, they weren't expecting that. And that really... Um, caused a lot of problems for them. So communication is an issue. And then as well as we have a lot of different departments within mm -hmm. Metro government involved in this. Yeah. Typically hasn't been the case. And they're not getting along. And they're not getting along, which is very important in the workplace, as we all know. Right. You know, equity is a word that keeps coming up. And how all, all this turmoil at Metro Arts is affecting how people think about funding the arts equitably. We've got these large institutional organizations, yet we have upstarts, and as you said, organizations, people, and artists of color who have been marginalized, normally haven't had access to these funds, aren't, have have now been allowed temporarily under Daniel Singh's decision, but it seems that that's being blocked. How is this all affecting the arts community as in totality? Yeah, that's a good question. I checked in with some arts organizations before this conversation, and um, you know, they've already been in a tough place um, getting their first 50 percent of their grant money late. Um, but now that they found out that they basically have to wait indefinitely for the second 50 percent, um, someone I talked to from a midsize organization says um, they are planning a less ambitious season for next year. They're not going to do one of the shows that they were thought, thought they were going to be able to do. Um, you know, the point being that a lot of funding planning has to happen years in advance sometimes. So this is really going to have some effects down the line. Um, th that person also pointed out to me that the the it, it, that these problems are going to disproportionately affect smaller organizations um, because they don't have as much rainy day money on hand for mm -hmm. when something like this happens. So I did talk to someone at a smaller organization who said that she's doing three times the amount of fundraisers um, and she also has to consider pay cuts for the fourth quarter, which will be this this spring for for her employees, which is not a good situation. Um, and she already has canceled a school program that she would have done in in some of the public schools. And at the end of it all, the arts and the people who love the arts are going to suffer the most here in this. Yeah, state. yeah, and and you know, there are people who say, well. Let's not let the discussion of equity get lost in all of this squabbling and all of these legal snafus. Um, there are a lot of people, particularly the activists who are from those smaller organizations and the individual artists who say, well, hold on. Daniel Singh has been a chaotic leader, but he is the first person at Metro Arts to do equity in a serious way. You know, um, in the past, um, I think Davey Tucker at Metro Human Relations said that 70% of money that Metro Arts has has uh, given out in its entire history have gone to the same 10 organizations. Um, so Daniel Singh, you know, he's been a chaotic leader, but he's started this really important conversation about equity, or rather, he didn't start the conversation. He brought it to Metro Arts mm -hmm. from the community. Um, and and so there's a lot of people who say, hold on, let's not throw out the bath, the, you know, the baby equity out with the bathwater, which is Daniel Singh's leadership. Okay. We have r briefly two things. What are you going to keep your eye on as this develops? And do you think, sounds to me like a lot of folks have to compromise. Do you think that's possible? Um, you know, I am going to keep an eye on those workplace misconduct complaints. I want to see what's going on. I'm going to keep an eye on the audit um, when that comes out that they say that's going to come out at the end of March. The human relations complaint report should come out in the next couple of weeks. So um, I will be busy these next couple of weeks. In terms of compromise, um, you know, it's interesting that you say that because um, basically the entire arts community agrees on one thing, which is that the city needs to give way more money to the arts. Um, they give about a sixth of a percent of the city budget, mm. teeny tiny amount to the arts. Uh, people want 1% of the city budget uh, to go to the arts. And and if that 
happen, that would be a historic commitment to funding the arts. There would be enough money for everybody that wants it right now. Um, but, you know, in the past, getting more money for the arts from the city has required all the organizations, big and small, the entire arts ecosystem to come together and to demand that. And with all of this internal squabbling and this internal angst, it's going to be a lot harder for them to come together and demand that money from the city. Mm. Char Destin is a reporter for WPLN. You can find his stories on the Metro Arts Council at WPLN.org. Char, thanks for your reporting and get rest. You're about to be very busy. Thanks, Khalil. This was fun. Yes, it was. All right, we're going to take a short break. Later on in the show, we're going to hear a little bit about the music census, part of the arts here in the state. In, in our city. But when we come back, we'll hear more about a controversial abortion law that's making its way through the state legislature, and we'll get an update on Mayor Freddie O'Connell's transportation referendum. Stay with us. This is Nashville. Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for PrEP and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil Colonna, and this is Nashville. We're talking with WPLN reporters about the news of the moment. Now, before the break, Char Dastin walked us through the drama happening at the Metro Arts Council. Now I'm joined by WPLN healthcare reporter Catherine Sweeney and WPLN Metro reporter Cynthia Abrams. Catherine, Cynthia, good to see you both again. Welcome back. Good to see you, Khalil. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Okay, Catherine, we're going to start with you. Cool. You cover health. I do. It's legislative session time. It is. That means you're covering abortion. Yep. All right. What does the focus seem to be this year? Yeah, so it seems like a lot of the abortion legislation kind of making its way through the state house is focusing on minors. Um, this past week, a bill that would have given kids 12 and under access to abortion got struck down. Um, critics were upset that it allowed for late term abortions. Uh, supporters were saying, you know, kids 12 and under can't consent to sex. They're automatically um, rape victims, they should have access to this procedure, but um, the bill died. It was five to two. And then another bill that is making its way through that seems to be getting a lot more success would criminalize helping teenagers get abortions if they're not your kid. So driving them out of state, helping them get the meds, um, that kind of stuff. Tell me more about this ban on helping teenagers. Yeah, so it would make it a felony, um, but the law is really vague about what kind of help counts. Um, there was a very similar bill that passed in Idaho, and the courts have put a block on it. One of the reasons is they don't know what counts. I mean, can I say the nearest clinic is in Carbondale? We don't know um, where that line is. But um, the author is Representative Jason Zachary. He's out of Knoxville, and he said he put the proposal forward after a parent called him in tears last year. Here's a clip from the bill's hearing. This dad was crying. I could hear the mom in the background. He said, what can you do to stop it? And I made call after call after call, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. Because an adult, they felt like coerced their 14-year-old child to go to West Tennessee, and then they took that child across state lines against the parent's wishes to get an abortion. Yeah. So he's saying parents should be the only adults who get a say in whether a child or a teenager gets an abortion. Um, but obviously, critics are saying a lot of the times family members um, are some are the person who gets somebody who's um, young and vulnerable pregnant or maybe a child wants an abortion and their parents don't support it. So um, there's a lot of tension there. Clearly, I'm, Yeah, I'm, I'm questioning whether if an adolescent is under guardianship of someone. Right. It's a parent or legal guardian. OK. So. All right. So. You know, this kind of ties into another story you did this week on medical records, right? Yeah, it does. So um, I started working on that last summer um, because uh, abortion is now a crime. It's a crime to perform one, not to get one. But um, we started looking into what kind of access 
law enforcement has to people's medical records. Uh, the Biden administration said, we think it's too much. That's scary. We want to change HIPAA. That's the medical record privacy law and shield these records from law enforcement. Um, a lot of state attorneys general were like, absolutely not. One of them was Tennessee's Jonathan Scrimetti. They said, you know, if you put this in place, we'll sue you. And there was a lot of debate about why that is, you know. So, I mean, obviously, critics of these AGs are saying they just want our abortion records uh, to go after people. Um, Scrimetti really brought up that the the law, I mean, the rule was really vaguely written. So it would have shielded a lot of reproductive health records. They were like, we can't investigate urologists for Medicaid fraud mm. if this goes through. So there was some back and forth on that. But yeah, we kind of like looked into how much access law enforcement has. And it's actually easier to get a hold of your personal medical records than it is to get a warrant to search your apartment. Um, wow. Because they only need a subpoena. So they have to, you know, to get a warrant to search your property, they have to get a court to be like, yeah, there's a pretty good chance this person committed this crime. It's probable cause. You only need a subpoena for somebody's medical record. So it just has to be relevant to your investigation. Okay. So on, on the law that the proposed law, the bill that's going to yeah. ban helping teenagers, if this were codified in law, what are the chances that it would withstand a legal challenge? I mean, it's really hard to say. And like, that is something that came up during these um, debates at the Capitol because Idaho's is not getting to be enforced right now. Um, they were concerned that the law is really vague, first of all, and second of all, that because it's vague, it could be arbitrary. So they're saying, you know, people could um, use it against people they don't like and enforce it unfairly. And so there's a pause on it while the courts decide whether it's constitutional. Um, and it's easy to assume that a similar lawsuit would happen if this bill did come to pass. So what are you going to keep your eye on as this develops? Uh, all that. Yeah. And I mean, again, um, the medical records stuff applies to that, because if somebody um, takes a teenager to get an abortion in New York, if you don't have any proof, you could say, oh, we were just going to go to Broadway. Um, but if there's evidence that they got an abortion while they were there, that means a lot more. Right. So, mm. yep. Just keeping an eye on all of that. OK. All right. Cynthia, there's this huge thing, transit referendum happening. But. If it's possible that someone missed it, I don't know if it is, because any listeners of the show will hear it last week. The mayor came on the show and actually talked about it. We discussed it for, at the top of the show. What are the basics of the referendum for those who may not know about it? Yes. So last week, Nashville's mayor, Freddie O'Connell, announced that he will be pursuing a transit referendum this fall. What that means is when Davidson County voters head to the polls to cast their ballots for president, you know, they will also be voting on whether or not to approve a plan that would establish a dedicated source of funding for transit, or in other words, a tax. You know, this could be a sales tax increase, a hotel motel tax, car rental. There's a lot of options, um, and it hasn't been decided yet. But that tax, tax would go directly towards transit. So it's big news, and it's something that a lot of us have been wondering for a while. Um, and... You know, Nashville is one of the last major cities in the U.S. to not have dedicated funding for transit. Um, but in Tennessee, there's a law that says that local governments can establish this tax without state approval just by taking it to voters. So right. that's what he's doing. OK, so what do we know about what could be included in it? You know, in all honesty, we don't know much. Um, and that's on purpose, because before O'Connell puts forth the plan, he wants input from across the board. So he's already established two advisory committees, one technical and one community based, which will solicit feedback from the public. Um, he's also in talks with Metro Council members and says he will be referencing over 70 planning efforts from across the last decade that have solicited input from 65,000 Nashvilleans. Um, but last week, he did give us like a little taste of what we can expect. OK, um, the plan is called Choose How You Move, an all access path to sidewalk signal service and safety. So it sounds like those are really going to be the core tenants of this plan. Um, it will focus on infrastructure like sidewalks, improving traffic signals and bus service. And of note, it will likely not feature something like light rail. All right. All right. So there's a possibility we're going to get sidewalks in Nashville. Just up for the voters Hopefully. to approve that. Yeah. Okay, interesting, interesting. Now, there was another referendum that we had. We really can't talk about this announcement without looking back at 2018. Tell us what happened then. Yeah, so in 2018, it was the first and last time that Nashville pursued a transit referendum. 
It was put forth by then Mayor Megan Barry, and it was an ambitious plan that over decades would have really transformed what transit looks like in Nashville. So it would have featured miles of light rail and rapid bus transit, as well as a nearly two mile long tunnel under downtown Nashville. Um, But in the end, it failed pretty resoundingly. You know, 64 percent of voters voted against it. So that's a precedent that O'Connell is really working against and doesn't want to see repeated. What were some of the challenges then? Yeah, so there's a few different reasons why experts think that the 2018 referendum failed. Um, And O'Connell has made it clear that he's trying to forge a somewhat different path. One of the main criticisms was that in 2018, the plan was too insular and didn't solicit the necessary feedback from the people who would actually be impacted by the transit plan. So now we're seeing O'Connell placing community input pretty high on his priority list before putting that plan forward. Um, In 2018, there was also Mayor Barry's resignation that occurred kind of in the midst of this effort. And that referendum also faced a robust opposition campaign. That's something we'll have to watch for in the coming months. Um, After O'Connell made his announcement last week, one of the primary opponents of the last referendum, which is the Koch brothers-backed group Americans for Prosperity, uh, released a statement saying that they're waiting to see the details of this plan before assuming their position. Um, There's a few other factors. You know, there's the cost, the 2018 plan with its miles of light rail, underground tunnel, etc., There was a bit of sticker shock. It was around $5.4 billion, although that cost is really over decades. Um, And some voters blame the scope and the cost for its loss. O'Connell hasn't given a cost estimate yet, but he did say that it would likely start with a B, as in billions. Mm. Um, But again, that's not money needed tomorrow. It's the cost over 30 years. So what's the mayor saying about what will be different with this go around? Yeah, you know, um, so, of course, the public feedback is something he's really prioritizing. Um, And, you know, he's he's taking his time as he's kind of crafting this effort. Um, Also, light rail, again, as I've mentioned, probably won't feature in this effort. Um, He's focusing more on infrastructure, sidewalks, bus bus service. So things that don't have that kind of shocking scope or cost associated with them is what's so this is probably going to take a long time and there's a lot to be figured out like you mentioned what's the timeline we're thinking about yeah so over the next six weeks o'connell is working with those advisory groups um technical advisory group and the community advisory group he's also working with the council and the public um, and his team to craft this plan Um, he's hoping to have it ready sometime in late march for the required financial audit And then it will have to be um, approved by Metro Council all before reaching voters on November 5th. All right. I know Nashvillians want something to be done for transportation and safety. As a Nashvillian yourself, do you think people are going to vote in favor? You know, it's something we'll have to see as the details of this plan are unveiled. um, We'll I'll be looking definitely to see how the public is responding, how transit advocacy groups are responding, what opponents will say. Um, I'm I'm curious as the details come out what what Nashvillians will think. Yeah, I don't think an underground tunnel <laughs> going underneath downtown is going to be on the plans. But hey, that'd be an easy way to get around. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I want to give many thanks to WPLN reporters Catherine Catherine Sweeney and Cynthia Abrams. Thank you both for your reporting and the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. We got to take a short break. When we come back, we'll learn more about the music census and how it could help people working in the music industry. Here's a hint. The music industry includes way more people than you may think. You can join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Look, we all know the cost of living in Nashville is pretty high, and the shifting financial realities of Music City are making it hard for a key demographic, those who work in the music industry. 
it's hard for them to work and live here. So how can musicians and those connected to the music industry find help? Enter the Music Census, a, quote, grassroots not-for-profit initiative that seeks to understand the lay of the land in Nashville and surrounding counties and use that data to inform policy decisions that will impact the future of music here in Music City. Now, here with me now are two people directly involved in the Music Census. Kelly Wahlberg is Vice President of Communications for the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee, and Mike Kopp is an artist, manager, music advocate who was volunteering with the Music Music Census. Kelly, Mike, thanks for being here. Welcome to This is Nashville. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Great to have you both with us. So Kelly, tell us, what is the Music Census? We're surveying. We want to hear from the voices of anybody that considers themselves a part of the music industry. It's it's the artists, it's the producers, it's the venue owners, it's those running the lights and the sound and behind the bar, the merchandisers, uh, the the runners, the anything that has to do. I have a friend that sews little uh, guitar covers for guitars. She's a part of the music industry. Mm. We want to hear from so many people, and we want to hear from wide, not just people that are living here in Nashville, but people that are living in the counties surrounding it. There's 14 counties involved. Okay, so what type of information are you all looking for? We're looking for what are the pressing issues, uh, do they Are they living in Davidson County? They moved to Music City to be a part of Music City. Are they still living in Davidson County, or have they had to move outward to be able to afford to live? What else, Mike? No, I think, uh, yeah, f- from the music perspective, um, I want to step back just a second. I mean, what Kelly's describing is, a, is uh, for people who don't know much about the music industry, it's an ecosystem. Mm-hmm. There, there's a lot of moving parts, and it's and it's very complicated, and... It's also very delicate and fragile. And if any part of that ecosystem is suffering, whether it's um, uh, lack of affordable housing, lack of uh, space to work, uh, uh, no access to to any kind of funds to support, you know, startup businesses in the ecosystem, if any one of that part of that ecosystem suffers, it, it does affect the entire the entire system. And so, I think the the intent of the survey is to find out what are those issues. Um, the Nashville Chamber, we were just talking about this off mic a minute ago, the Nashville Chamber did uh, a pretty exhaustive uh, study back in 2019, looking at a lot of these kinds of things. Um, but that was four years ago. Mm-hmm. And the industry is changing just like Nashville's changing. And so it's it's time. It's 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 almost been too long now. We need to we need to check the heartbeat of the industry and that ecosystem and see see what are the what are the pressure points. I understand this is a diagnosis of our local ecosystem, but, you know, you both have experience in the music industry, years of experience in it. Just from what you can say, do you think that ecosystem is in a healthy place right now? No, I, I, I personally, I don't. And and this comes from, from anecdotal experience. Um, I, uh, be, be, because I hang out a shingle as an artist manager, I get calls from a lot of uh, young artists who are looking to, to break into the industry. Um, and, um, the, the number one issue I hear is um, a lack of an infrastructure uh, to support those artists that are trying to just get their footing. That maybe they graduated from one of the, the music schools, Belmont or, or MTSU. They're trying to get a footing. Um, they're trying to find resources to be able to afford to make their art. Um, and they need space to, to find, they need to find space in order to make that art. And those kind of Resources just aren't readily available unless you have a lot of money, uh, or or a lot of you know access to 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 private funders, and so right off the bat, it's it's already uh, people are already at a disadvantage when they're trying to enter into the industry here in Nashville. Now, some folks I lived in Los Angeles pursuing a music career. There was not a citywide movement to help artists making it, and that was part of the weeding out process. They would mm-hmm. say, you know, the cream rises to the top if you can withstand it. You come out here with your keyboard, your guitar, your bass, your drums, and a dream. You have to pound the pavement and make it work on your own. It sounds like Nashville and what you're doing at the Community Foundation is to provide resources so people don't necessarily have to take that arduous path. Is that right, Kelly? That's what we're hoping to go towards. First, we have to have the data to understand what the needs are. We're hoping that could there be a a live music fund that comes out of this? I was at a party recently and former council member Jeff Syracuse talked about a cultural land trust 
to be able to provide and preserve and promote the music venues that have been such a staple, but the rising cost of rent, our property taxes, or even the liquor costs, all the things it takes to run a business, they're struggling each and every day to be able to just simply survive. And that's the fabric of our community. We are Music City. We need to be able to keep that alive. And so what we find out from this, we're hoping that funders will see the need. We're hoping policymakers will understand what kind of policies can be set in motion to help support the creative class. It's kind of ironic to me that Music City's ecosystem yeah. is not the strongest out there. Well, and that's, and uh, to, to go back to a point you were making, I think, is uh, th and, and Kelly was uh, was underscoring, is we put out this Music City brand, and we invite people to come here, uh, business to, I, I was in the economic development world for a while, and one of the one of the things that we put forth when we were trying to encourage an industry to move to Nashville is we have this incredible creative community. We have music and art and theater and opera, and, and that's a that's a selling point to bring new jobs, higher paying jobs, which is the, you know, the economic development uh, mission. But then when you start to look at the underbelly of that, and you know, there there was a, another s a survey done recently by a group called the Other Nashville Society, which is seventeen hundred independent artists, not country artists. Just a few months ago, they did a survey of their membership. Majority of them said, "We're going to have to move. We can't live here and create in Nashville." Mm -hmm. So, if we're putting forth this brand and we're using it to be an economic driver, and we're not able to support it, that's a problem. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil A. Colonna. We're talking this hour about the Music City Census. My guests about the Music Census, pardon me, my guests are Kelly Wahlberg and Mike Kopp. You know, I'm thinking about this. Every Not everyone in Nashville really is on the same level in the music industry. Like, Toby Keith has a different experience than a friend of mine who's a singer-songwriter and is releasing her first project. How does the Music Census take that gap? of exposure, of resources, how does it take that into mind? Well, I think, first of all, we to, to Kelly's point earlier, we need to find out, we need to get a good snapshot of, of what makes up that ecosystem. We don't need to assume that it's uh, a heavy emphasis on the performing artist or recording or engineers. We need to understand what, what is the snapshot. There's been so much movement in and out of Nashville since the pandemic. So I think, first of all, we need to establish, like, what is the industry and what is the ecosystem? And then, hopefully, if we can reach different parts of that ecosystem, we'll learn what are the pressure points for that ecosystem, the people that are participating in it. And I think from that, we'll be able to learn and answer the question you're asking. All right. Kelly, you mentioned this before about Nashville and some of the areas and the cities involved. What are what cities and counties are involved in this, in this music census? So I call them the donut counties okay. around Davis County, Wilson County, Rutherford. We're going down to Murray County where uh, Columbia, Tennessee is. There's really artistic community there all the way up to Montgomery County where Clarksville is. Uh, we have a map at musiccitycensus.com. So if you're wondering if your county um, is uh, eligible to be taking the census, I would recommend going there and checking it out. All right. Now, I, I mentioned before that you both are in the music industry. You, Kelly, you moved here. To get a job in the music industry, right? I did. What was that? I came here to work on the business end, as Mike does, and I started as a booking agent and quickly moved into a music festival promoter um, that was also supporting that job by being a third-party promoter and getting clients myself. That's back in the day when you could still pound posters on the light poles and mm -hmm. um, get people in the venues. MySpace was the big thing. I was coding MySpace pages to make everything look good. Um, and I loved I loved the music, music festival piece and being ingrained in the community, and I needed to look elsewhere to be able to get health insurance. That's a big thing. We're lucky these days we have nonprofit organizations that are dedicated to giving health and, you know, finding health insurance for musicians and people in the industry. Um, that wasn't something that I knew resource for. And that in turn led me to the community foundation where we had a program called nowplayingnashville.com. And I was able to keep myself tied to the industry um, and then eventually have moved into the full-on philanthropic space. Well, how have you both seen the industry in town change over the past couple of years? Well, from my perspective, I, I, it seems like there is a, uh, there's a burgeoning uh, technology, music technology sector. 
Um, I've uh, know some people that have worked uh, as mentors in the uh, in the entrepreneurship center and the music division of it, and uh, it seems like there's a lot a lot of that kind of energy coming here that uh, I didn't see a dozen years ago when I first started working here. Um, we were talking earlier about the advent of AI now that's uh, already prevalent in the industry, and of course it's becoming more and more of an issue. Um, I think the advent of, of AI in the industry is going to, we're going to see even more of that kind of technology, um, energy, and knowledge coming into this marketplace, creating creating jobs that we don't even imagine exist right now. That's the biggest change for me. Kelly? I would say it's access to what people are able to do. I mean, to be able to record mm-hmm. your full album mm-hmm. in your house on your own, no other person, and then maybe send it off to get mastered, that's a big difference than when I moved here two decades ago. Mm. Two decades ago, you needed to go find the space, find the producer, find the engineer who's going to do this for you. Mm. And so I think that's another um, point of people wanting to move to Music City as well because things are more accessible and they think that they can get further faster, but then then we get there, they can't afford to live here. Yeah, uh, I, I, they, it's hard to find the gigs or the gigs that they can get. There's restrictions on you can't play your own music. You've got to play what we're telling you to play on the stage. As I've said on this show many times, rent is too damn high around here. It, it is, you know, and, and this brings up another point about the, the lack of, of uh, performing space venues. Um, we've had, you know, we've seen a lot of venues close their doors. Um, a lot of it happened during the pandemic. We don't see them coming back. And I think there are a lot of young artists. I hear this from young artists thinking they can come to Nashville and they'll at least be able to perform even if they don't have a record deal. And the fact is you can't, mm-hmm. it, it just doesn't exist. And that's, that's part of, that's the part of that ecosystem that is so fragile right now and, and the most vulnerable. So when we think about the ecosystem and musicians, we think about artists, singers, songwriters, mm-hmm. musicians, producers, engineers, mm-hmm. booking agents, tour managers. Those are normal positions in the music industry that folks will think about. But what are some of the other ones that listeners may have no idea about that are directly involved? If I may give one example, and this is this is close to home. So I have a daughter um, who moved from New York. She was an actor in New York. She came to Nashville during the pandemic and started an independent film company. The majority of her work is music videos. Um, she's not a musician. She's not an artist. In fact, before we started talking about the census, I asked her if she would categorize herself as being part of the music industry. She said, no, I'm a filmmaker. Yet the bulk of her work is creating music videos, which support the artist. So that's a challenge we have with the census is reaching the parts of the creative community, whether it's choreographers or I have another friend who designs uh, outfits for Reba McIntyre. If you ask him, he doesn't necessarily say he's part of the music industry, but he's outfitting the music industry. We've got to reach those people somehow. You know, a lot of folks, they may think that the music industry is just, you know, going to see shows and they don't think about the shows. They don't think about what it takes to get the show or the artist here. They just want to see their favorite artists perform and they leave it at that. What's it going to take? I want to hear this from both of you. Mm -hmm. What's it going to take to kind of wake people up who have taken the easy access and the availability of such amazing music in our town for granted? Kelly. Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> I think it's going to take us just continuing to raise awareness about it and talk about it. And we have a couple different types of partnership levels with the music census that folks can join on. Um, one is the community engagement partner where these are the businesses and the organizations that are stepping up to spread the word. But we also have a creative connector a partnership. And those are the individuals that are like the video producers, or I tell the story about I was a production runner for TPAC and I got a 15 passenger van, went to a warehouse in an underdeveloped neighborhood, went, found out they were building chimes and tuning chimes there. You know, it's like, it's, 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 I think it's just that natural domino effect of you hear a friend talking about it, you hear a friend talking about it, then all of a sudden someone that is taking advantage of the fact that they just come in and show up and join the music and leave they're see, they're, we're talking about it. We're learning from each other, and there's a new appreciation that's developed. I, I, I think that's that's exactly right. And I think you know, to to your point about what's it going to take, uh, it's going to take as much participation as we can get from members of that ecosystem, and 
people being made aware of how fragile and vulnerable it is. Mm -hmm. And that's only going to come. We can sit here and give anecdotes. We need to hear from the thousands and thousands of people in the creative community. We need to hear their voices. Their voices have not been heard. And that's the whole point of the census. Well, how can people participate and make their voices heard? Beginning March 1st, the Music Census will open up at Music Census. Music City Census, excuse me, musiccitycensus.com. It'll be open for three weeks. This census takes about 15 minutes to take. You could take it on your phone or on a desktop. And after that, we are part of a cohort of 20 other cities that are also doing this work or have done it or getting ready to launch it. We'll be able to benchmark and learn from each other and know what other cities are doing to help come to solution. Have you spoken with other cities who've already done it? What have they talked about from their experience? There is. It's nice. It's a it's a great group. It's a, There's a monthly call where everybody gets together. Sacramento uh, finished theirs and... The mayor really like latched on to what the results were and they they've picked some of the low hanging fruit that they learned from it. Um, they're trying to break down those barriers. You talked about not enough venue space or, or places to do shows. They want to take they want to make permitting way easier for artists to be able to use those spaces that are available or even streamline it so it's available online. Have one member at the city level to talk to so you're not getting bounced around from department to department. Mm. Um, Things like that. Austin, Austin's been surveying their music landscape for a long time. Um, and they're actually one of the cities that is doing this cultural land trust. And they were able to save a 50 year old venue from going under um, by just having that those funders available, um, having money come in from the state. We're really lucky in Tennessee, I feel like, because now we have a state led commission, entertainment commission and also a city commission. Um, so. It's just going to take us all working together and learning from each other. But those commissions need to hear from the creative community to see what the needs are. Yes. You know, earlier in the show, we had our, our reporter, Char Destin, talk about the dramas that are happening mm-hmm. over at Metro Arts Commission. And but the, there's potential for the results of the Music City Census to have someone to a liaison within the city. I'm asking this question. How confident are you all that the city is going to respond in kind to the needs of the Music City ecosystem that we have here, given everything that the city is facing. I looked our now Mayor Freddie O'Connell in the eye and asked him where he was on the music industry. And he gave us, um, it left no doubt that he would be supportive of whatever the ecosystem needs. And myself and I think others like me are going to hold him accountable to it. Kelly? Well, they're already in process of conducting a music venue survey themselves to see how we can support the independent venues in here. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to run with it and I'm going to hope for the best. All right. So after the the census is over, what do you plan to do with the data? A lot of crunching. I think, you know, depending on what comes out of that, um, there will be policy initiatives and ideas to bring forth to local and state legislators and, uh, and, and influencers. Um, so yes, it's, it's the, the information that's gathered is not going to sit on a shelf. It's, it's gonna, we believe it's going to impact policy for the next, for the next several years. All right. But a couple minutes left. I want to hear from both of you, Mike, you first. Why is it important that we have a healthy ecosystem, music, music industry ecosystem here in our city and region? Well, I think if, if we, uh, I'll, I'll answer this, uh, from a, from a, a economic development position, um, Nashville has benefited from a lot of industry growth, a lot of, uh, new industries and, and, and new businesses moving here, corporations and otherwise. And they have been, we've all benefited from, to a certain extent, benefited, benefited from that growth. And that growth has largely been driven by an, uh, a belief that this is a very strong, robust, creative community. And there's a lot of creativity to support the business world. If we lose that, we lose one of our major economic drivers. And that is going to affect this city for generations to come. Kelly. I could piggyback off that. If you look at the top three industries that are driving the economic development, it's health, it's entertainment, and it's tourism. Well, why is tourism so big? Because our entertainment is just top class. 
when I came here and went to an open mic night, I felt like I was on a full on concert when I first moved here. Mm -hmm. And it was incredible. And those, these people are just getting up and playing one or two songs. And if we lose that, we lose so much magic. That is what makes up Music City. I want to thank you both for coming on to the show. I can just I can just uh, relate to what you just said, Kelly. I go to, to karaoke sometimes. And it feels like I'm at American Idol. I'm like, this is not karaoke in the towns I've been in. People can really sing out here. Yes. It's something else. Well, I would really want to thank you both, my guests. Kelly Wahlberg with the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee and Mike Kopp. He is artist manager, artist artist advocate and music census volunteer again thank you both so much for being with us today one more time where can people find out information about the music census musiccitycensus.com all right you heard it there everybody if you're in the music industry related to the music industry or curious about the music industry go there and be a part of this census it only helps benefit the city Thanks again to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. And thanks to you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville as a production of Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by Magnolia McKay. It was directed by Tasha A.F. Lemley. Our board operator is Liv Lombardi. Very, very happy birthday to you and your twin, Ari. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. Special thanks to Catherine Cece's, Miriam Kramer, and Tony Gonzalez. You can listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. And the conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you on Monday, everybody. And be good to each other.